in a word of prayer before we get started. Um, God truly has a word for our hearts. So we're just going to pray that God does a wonderful work in this place. So Lord, we come to you thanking you for this opportunity. Thank you for this day. God, I pray that you would bless your people as they're here to hear a word from you, God. We pray that you would move in a mighty way, that you would open hearts, open ears, and let us truly receive what you have for us to receive from you today. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So our topic today is prayer and we are talking about how to lighten your load remember this is the lighten your load series have you guys have been enjoying that so far we're trying to get off some of these dead weights so we could be ready uh, to take on whatever God has for us so we're gonna lighten our load today with prayer lighten our load through prayer everybody say prayer now although prayer is meant to help lighten the burdens that we have at the same time, just mentioning the word prayer fills most of us with a sense of anxiousness, guilt, or shame somehow, right? Am I right? Uh, you know, as you're sitting here like, great, we're talking about prayer. Great. Another thing to feel guilty about, like, you know, I really want a better prayer life. Anyone in here want a better prayer life? Right? But even right now, if I was to ask someone to get up and pray, if I just walk through the audience like, hey, I need someone, you know, I didn't really like that prayer. I want somebody just to open a prayer, right? Anyone? People start looking around and looking at their watch. Dude, look at the time. And hearts start beating like, you know, trying to not make eye contact. Like, hey, anyone want to pray? You know, we kind of get this anxiousness, right? You start feeling all like, oh, no, don't call on me. Don't look at me, right? So is prayer a blessing or a burden sometimes? Think about it. If you go to the bookstore right now, you go to the Christian book aisle, look up prayer. How many books, hundreds of books will you see on prayer, right? Or just even Google how to pray. You're going to be going through pages and pages and pages of, of, of how to pray, right? Um, strangely, prayer has become more of a burden than a blessing in our lives. Can I get an amen? If I got any real transparent people in here who will say like, oh, geez, right? You're already getting a little antsy just even thinking about prayer. I mean, most of the time, we are very insecure about our prayer life. Can we just be, am I any, I'm, uh, I'm the only one up here. Y'all gonna leave me up here? All right, thanks. You know, we, we get really insecure. Like, you know, I don't pray enough. Anybody feel like that? Like, you know, we got our, our brothers and sisters in other faiths. They praying three times a day. They got their little stuff out. They doing all, you know, and we like, oh, when's the last time I pray? Right? Or am I praying right? You ever feel like that? Like, am I even saying the right things? You know, you're supposed to do like a rosary or a Hail Mary or like, a, you know, we're like, am I even doing all right? Or how many just, I feel awkward when I pray. Like, you're like, hey, God. Yeah, house heaven. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to wrap this up. Right? We feel a little awkward. Or, you, you know, we don't know what to say. Like, are you supposed to have, like, fancy words? You see people who are like, oh, Lord, thou art great and high and mighty and lifted up. You know, am, am I saying things right? Or maybe I don't even pray long enough. Like, you got, like... An hour that changes the world. Then it came 15 minutes that changes the world. It's like a five-minute prayer to God. Like, am I even praying long enough? You know, you get some of the season saints, and they're like, I was in the prayer closet for three hours today. You'd be like, oh, man. I prayed in the car a little bit, right? Or, or maybe, you know, we feel insecure because we feel like, you know, God's probably mad at me just saying um and I'm really not worthy of uh I don't know I feel like if I pray a lightning bolt might be coming down he's probably mad he's like oh, I know you not praying see that's how we think God does to us who, who are you talking to <laughs> no right or you know maybe some of us are kind of salty with God because we really didn't get what we asked for like when we were five or 
you know, or recently. No, those don't st those things stick with you. Like I asked God for a bike and I never got it and I don't know about prayer, right? So sometimes we're a little salty and sometimes it's a little deeper things. Like someone passes away or you ask for healing for someone and it doesn't happen or, you know, something falls apart in your, in your home or a relationship and you're kind of wondering like, what's up with that guy, right? Am I in the right place? Or sometimes we just have the wrong concept of prayer. Um, often we don't pray, we just give God suggestions. Like here's, here God, here's my list of suggestions. Thank you. All right, I think you should be doing things better. And here's my copy. Um, or we see God as a Santa or a genie. Like God, um, if I just do these things, you'll give me what I want, right? I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna not cut somebody out. And then I could get what I want, right? We're like bargaining with God. Or prayer is all, often one big monologue where we're just doing this whole, you know, four-page monologue to God. And there's, there's no, there's no, I'm sorry, monologue to God, but there's no dialogue back and forth. We're just telling God and telling God and telling God and telling God, like, whew, okay, I feel better. I prayed. Check. Okay, I'm going about my day. But we didn't hear anything back from God. It's just a one-way conversation. Or a lot of times we only talk to God when we're in trouble or in a hardship or, we, you know, we're trying to cut a deal if you just get me out of this one last time. I promise. And it's, you know, whatever that thing that you're going to follow up with that we never really follow up with, right? Um, so these are the things about, uh, about prayer. And everybody already in here is looking really stressed out. <laughs> you guys are looking real stressed out right now. Like, I just brought up everybody's issue. And they're like, oh, gosh. So let's just, everybody, we're going to take a deep breath. We're going to take a deep breath. Because today we're talking about lightening our load. We're going to take the pressure out of prayer. So everybody, take a deep breath. Just woosa. We're going to take the pressure. We're going to lighten the load of prayer. And I really feel that God has a wonderful thing to teach us, and it can really revolutionize our prayer life. Are you guys ready to receive it? Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to go to Romans 8. It's an amazing chapter just in of itself but if you could turn your your bibles um or your app or device or come on little guy great there we go oh, too far nobody look all right there we're in romans 8 romans 8 14 through 17 and we're going to lighten the load of our prayer life, which is two concepts that are found in this scripture. Are you guys, everybody there with me? It says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. In order to lighten the load of our prayer life, the first thing we must do is realize who we are in God. Everyone say, realize who we are in God. Who we are. Yes, you guys sound good. A little choir out here. Um, this scripture is so pivotal because it starts off saying that we are um, the sons of God. And we did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. A lot of times when we're approaching God, we're kind of got this fearful mode. And it's as though we're a slave. We're coming to God. Hey, hey, God, just wondering you know, we're real, is it okay if I can just, oh, maybe not, okay, never, or we're waiting for that, you know, that lightning bolt to fall, or we know that he sees what we're doing wrong, so we're kind of tentative, we're coming to God all gingerly, and he says that we have not received 
the spirit of a slave, but instead we have received the spirit of adoption as sons. We've received the spirit of sonship. We have not received the spirit of a slave, but we have received the spirit of sonship. Ladies, don't get salty. This is for us too. So you've received a spirit of a daughter towards God. This is very pivotal because God has adopted us. If you are a child of God, you have been adopted. Now, why is this important? Because when God adopts you, he doesn't adopt you as like you're a foster kid. Like, hey, kid, just live here. Don't do too much and just go about your way. This is awesome news because he has brought us into his family. And when God adopted us, he gave us full rights. We are not viewed as guests, but we are family. So the first thing you have to know when you have become a child of God is that you're no longer a slave. You're a son. You've been adopted. So that means that everything, like, this is for the, we're going we to kill them. Oh, older people, older generation, we're about to kill the young people. They, ain't, they don't know nothing about this. Y'all remember different strokes? No, young people, y'all don't remember none of that. they like, different strokes, what is that? Y'all remember different strokes, old people? Nah, I see now. Don't fake it if you don't know. Mr. Willis. What you talking about, Willis? I mean, Mr. Drummond. Mr. Drummond. Well, now the world don't move. Yeah. They don't know nothing. Who know that? The old people. Thank you, older people. Y'all young people, YouTube it. You guys remember that whole scenario? You got the little guys living in the hood. That might have been problematic back then. We had to think about these things. They used to feed us. But you got the little guys living in the hood. Mr. Drummond finds them and invites them to live in the penthouse. Remember that? So everything he had now is theirs, right? This full adoption. So we think, think of God like that. He has adopted you. I want you to think about this, this, this scenario. God is the king of everything. He has adopted you, but we're coming to him as though we're slaves. Don't you hate when you have a good friend and you, you invite them over to your house and they're asking for things? It's like, oh, is it okay if I use your bathroom? It's like, girl, if you don't go in there and use that. <laughs> Can I please get some water or something you know you ever have some people act real gingerly around you it's the same concept with God we have been given we are adopted and we're still approaching God as yes sir master is there anything yes no 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 right we have been adopted with God. We're no longer foster child. Now look at this. Look at this. It says, you will be given the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, our father. Check out verse 17. It says, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This is amazing. This, will, this is about to like blow your mind, this concept. An heir is a person who is legally entitled to property or rank of another person that another person has after their death. Who died for us? Who died for us? So after he died, we, are then be, we have then become heirs with him. He gave us an inheritance when he died. So we are now co-heirs. With Christ. So just think how great God is. This is who we are in God. Not only did he just save us, it would have been okay if he just saved us. Okay, great, we're going to heaven. Not only that, he adopts us. Not only that, he makes us heirs with him. Do you know the heirs were just, revo just uh, reserved for the firstborn child, according to the Bible? It's always the firstborn child. If you're the firstborn boy, you got everything. So once the, your dad dies, you get the house, you get the land, you get the, then you get the portion to everybody else. Look how awesome God is. He saves us, adopts us, and then he makes it as though we are all firstborns. Think about that. We're all firstborn heirs, which means... We have the privilege of sharing Christ's inheritance. As adopted sons and daughters of God, Christians, we are treated as firstborn heirs. Our inheritance includes salvation, eternal life, and even a measure on the throne of Christ. Revelations 3.21 says, He who conquers, I will grant with him to sit with me on my throne, as I have conquered and sat down on my father's throne. What? We could even be on a throne one day just chilling? 
in heaven with God? Are you guys realizing what you have in God? And a lot of times in prayer, we don't know who we are, so we're coming to God as though we're slaves. When you really have been adopted, God has given you everything that you need in him. So there, you're not coming to him super uh, gingerly. Now, not only that, we have to realize who we are in God. We also have to embrace the reality of Father God. Now, this, is ama- this was amazing to me as I studied this. Um, we have in this verse, in verse uh, 15, or it says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. A lot of times we just read over that, like, oh, that's cool, yeah, Abba, Father, yeah. All right, and you keep on moving down. But Abba, Father was an uh, Aramaic Hebrew word for father. So it's as though uh, he just says, Father, Father. But Abba is a child's word, such as a little child utters when he first opens his mouth. So it's like, Daddy, God. It's like, Dada, like, like Papa, right? So this is, the, this is what we have in God, to speak. We, we cry out, Dada, to God. He's our Daddy God. So this concept is crazy, right? Especially some of the grown men, like, hey, I ain't doing no Dada. <laughs> no, nah, bruh, I ain't doing Daddy God, right? Some in us don't want to see God like that. But do you remember in Mark 10, it says, Jesus said, I truly tell you, Anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child would never enter it. It's something about a little child that's able to just run freely to their dad or their parent and be like, Daddy! Just running up to them and have, there's no like protocol. There's no like, hey, father, can I please come and sit in your lap? Right? Right? In a true, genuine, you know, non-dysfunctional relationship, children are super juiced to see their parents. We're talking in theory here. So this is the same Abba Father. I want you guys to really sit with this. I want you to get this. Abba Father is the same word Jesus used in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark 14, 36, when he cried out and said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. If you could remove this cup from me, yet not I will, but what you will. The same word where Jesus was in agony, about to die for us. When he was like, you know, if there's any other way we could do this, it would be great. But if it's not, I'm ready to go through with it. He didn't cry out. Oh, holy God, thou art the one who I come to. He cried out, Daddy, Daddy, is there any other way? So taking that verse and putting it into into Romans, Paul here says that we have that same right to approach him as Daddy God. Daddy God. Now, you got to, this was, this was revolutionary for Jews because no Jews call God father, like ever, like growing up the whole Old Testament and before Jesus, um, they were only called him Jehovah. Um, they only used the, 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 the name Adonai and even Yahweh, but they didn't even pronounce it at all. He was, you don't say God's name. He's just, he's, he's just God. Right, so when Jesus came on the scene talking about, hey, when you pray, say our Father. They're like, what? You don't call God Father? What is he talking about? And if you just do a study of every time God would say, hey, call God Father. He's Father. He's, he broke a barrier. This was revolutionary for God to be your Father. So what does that mean for us in prayer? That means that now, according to Hebrews 4 and 16, we have a new posture. Let us then draw nigh with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find help in a time of need. No longer 
Do we have to come to God all cowardly and scared? But I want you to come, I want you to think about coming to God as dada, as, as a father, as, hey, daddy God. That takes the, the load off of prayer. That takes the pressure off the prayer, off of prayer. Because, you know, we've been coming to God all systematically. I want you to change your paradigm on today and think about embracing who you are. I am a child of God. I have been adopted by God. Do you believe that? You have to believe that. A lot of us are like, no, no, I'm still not worthy. You have to have faith to believe that God loves you that much and you have been adopted. That means you have every right, everything God has, you have. You need love. You need peace. You need joy. God is love. You need love. Everything he has, you have. Have you thought about that? We're so busy being slaves, chasing it. Oh, Lord, I hope I do everything right. This is God wants you to embrace the reality of him being daddy, father. Come on, just try it. Everybody say daddy. Grown men still like, I don't know about, hey, oh, God. Come on, men. Say daddy. Not just, all right. So many of us, many of us, I understand. I understand. I could already feel it. I could already hear it. Many of us struggle with the concept of God as father. Earthly, earthly fathers fail their children. Even those who are good by human standard are still not perfect. Sadly, there are many fathers who are abusive and neglect, neglectful. These fathers are not a reflection of who God is as a father. You need to hear this. A lot of times we don't respond to God as father because we're like, well, I didn't really like my dad, or I didn't have a dad, or my dad was jacked up. So I'm not really relating to God as father. But God, he's a perfect father. He doesn't disappoint like our earthly fathers do. He doesn't abuse or shame us, but he does discipline us in love, according to Hebrews 12, 7. He deserves and even demands respect. He is also incredibly loving and intimately personal. He knows our needs and supplies them. So think of him as being as, as a judge. Say if your dad is a judge, right? When you go into the courtroom that your dad's presiding in, you know, you still give him the respect that he's due. You walk in like, oh, hey, your honor, right? You don't go, what's up, dad? In the middle of the courtyard, in the middle of the court. But after court, you go into his chamber, it's like, hey, dad, what's up? Same with God. He is worthy to be praised and respected. He is God. But guess what? Jesus broke the barrier so you could go behind the scenes. You could go into his chambers and say, hey, dad, what's up? How you doing? Jesus died for this. This is such exciting news. In the Old Testament, I always, I love making the, compar the comparison to the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, this was unheard of. They had to go through all these protocols to get to God. Kind of like the, the Wiz, the Wizard of Oz, either one, take your pick, which one you like the best. Same concept. Remember when they had to approach God and it was all scary and lightning and fire and they were like, oh, you know, that's kind of how people thought about God in the Old Testament. We got to do everything just right. got to bring sacrifice. Gotta, if you don't do it just right, you're going to be knocked out and earth's going to swallow up. You know, it was a lot going on before Jesus. But when Jesus died for us, when he broke that veil, he created where we could have access to God. It's amazing. We now have access to God. We don't have to go through all those protocols. You could just go right into the presence of God, like Hebrew said, and come boldly to his throne and say, Daddy, Daddy, what's up? Hi. This is taking the burden off of prayer. So then knowing all this, prayer becomes simple. It's not complicated. Knowing all we just learned about adoption, about daddy God, prayer, prayer becomes simple. We don't, we don't 
fear God. We don't fear approaching God in prayer. We pray to our Father knowing that he is king, but he also loves us and calls us his own. Therefore, prayer is conversational. Simply talking to God. Simply talking to God. Um, one of my favorite verses is Exodus 33, 11, and this was Moses, um, the relationship Moses had with God. It says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Sit and, and sit, just sit with that for a minute. Although, you know, no man can see God and live, this is not what they're not talking about. He saw God face to face. But the kind of relationship we had with God, even in the Old Testament, was amazing. He would talk to God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. That's simple. That's simple prayer. Oh, we're going to revolutionize our prayer life. It's real simple. So no sophisticated or eloquent words are needed. Prayer is not a magic formula or exact right words. It's conversation with your dad. Right? Also, um, two, um, prayer is paying attention to God. Um, Charles Pope, the Archdiocese of Washington, wrote a great article that was amazing. And he stated, one of the nicest and briefest descriptions of prayer I have ever read comes from Dr. Rolf Martin in his book, The Fulfillment of All Desire. Dr. Martin says beautifully in what is succinct and yet comprehensive, prayer is at its root simply paying attention to God. Let that sit with you for a minute. Such a wonderful image, paying attention to God. Imagine that, actually paying attention to God, so simple yet so often overlooked. More traditionally, I've heard prayer defined as conversation with God, like we just said. True enough and well attested, but the definition sheds light, less light since many, while able to grasp the talking part of conversation, are less able to grasp or appreciate the listening part of a conversation. And thus, there's a lot of emphasis on recited prayers, intercessory prayers, etc. Good in themselves and yet required. But um, when and how does one listen? One could theoretically recite long prayers, but at the end, pay very little attention to God. Thus, this is usually, you know, not malicious or prideful, but it's awfully, awfully simply due to the fact that our minds are very weak and thus conversation, the definition of it, has pitfalls and limits. But how different to go to prayer saying, I'm going aside now to spend time and pay attention to God. I'm going to sit still and listen while he speaks. I'm going to think on his glory, rejoice in his truth, ponder deeply as I can in his presence. Isn't that beautiful? Simply paying attention to God. And this is taking the burden off of prayer. Taking the pressure off of prayer. Everybody, let's just take a step back at what, uh, how we approach this thing. I often find myself in condemnation, like, oh, I don't pray enough. I should pray more. I feel like I should do but let's just transform it into we just talking to God and we're just paying attention to God. God, what are you up to? What are you doing? Where, where can I see you working in my life? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I, you know, most of our, our prayers is a roll call. Bless my family, bless my life, bless my family, bless my job, bless my dog. Bless my, it's just bless me, bless me, bless me, bless, bless me. We ain't talking about nobody but just us four and no more. Like, that's our concept of prayer. But God, what are you doing at my job? What are you doing in my community? How can I help this person that's really getting on my nerves? How can I be a blessing to them? Paying attention to God is taking the selfishness out of prayer. All right. So this is the question that usually the elephant that's in the room that nobody, because we're in church, nobody really wants to say out loud, but I'm going to help you. I'm going to say it for you. You can thank me later. Why pray if God already knows everything? Anybody ever think about that? Or be like, what is this all for? 
if you already know what's going to happen, God, why even bother with the whole rigmarole in the middle? Right? Anybody ever felt like that? No, no nobody going to admit. Thank you, sis. Everybody going to just leave me up here on the stage. It's okay. Why pray when God already knows everything? I have, uh, we have a couple of things we'll find out. First thing is fellowship. Why pray if God already knows everything? Um, 1 John 1 and 3 says, That which we have seen, which we have heard, and proclaimed to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Why pray if God already knows everything? Because God wants a relationship with you. He wants it. He wants a relationship with you. I want you to get that in your head because we're so busy with the slave mentality. Like, no, no, God doesn't want me. Think about this. He wants you. What relationship that you know could thrive unless people talk? Think about it. You know, maybe on, you know, we do the little online dating and stuff. And, you know, you can say somebody's your boo. But if you never talk to them, are they really your boo? <laughs> Y'all never talk. Do you guys go out? No. Do you talk? No. Do you go on dates? No. But that's my boyfriend. <laughs> Is that really a relationship? Think about it. Same thing with God. Can you really have a relationship with someone you never talked to. It's the same concept. Or would you, this is another, would you honestly, y'all don't have to raise your hand, y'all already left me up here a few times. <laughs> would you honestly just talk to God if you didn't want anything? If you didn't have any, like I'm good. Everything, bill pay, money, I'm good. Would you, usually, man, when you're going through, you like, Lord Jesus, when, when the church open? Are they open on Tuesdays? I don't know. I'm just going to go by and see. We need the Lord when things are going wrong. Um, but this is what we were talking about earlier. Jesus died to restore this fellowship with God. Pre you guys don't, oh, you don't understand the... The age we live in, we are blessed to be New Testament saints. And look at everything we have access to and we still don't access God. We have access to, we have access to God. And we still like, hmm, I'll pray when I want to. We'll see. We used to have to do doves and turtles and bulls and things. We don't got to do none of that. And we still ain't praying, Lord, help us. Help me. Help me, Jesus. You know, now we can come freely to God. But we still stay far away because of religion, because of formalities, because of condemnation. We feel like I'm just not good enough. God doesn't want to talk to me. There's nothing he could want to say to me. But I'm here to tell you that that's wrong. God wants fellowship with you. It's a relationship. This is what we talked about and charged up so much with the young people. He wants a relationship with you. You have to get that in your mind. You are an adopted child. That doesn't mean you're a foster child. Everything he has belongs to you. So he wants to embrace you. All right. The next thing, why do we need to pray if God knows everything? It's for our development. Colossians 1.9 uh, this is in the NIV, one of my favorite scriptures ever. It says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and, and understanding that the spirit gives. It's for our development. When we pray, God is growing us. God is growing us. And if you never, if you ever pray, have you ever prayed and didn't receive immediately what you asked for? You've been there before? You prayed and you didn't get it right away? Man, yes, we have been there. God, but I want you to know that God answers every prayer. Did you know that? God answers every prayer. He answers yes. He answers no. And then he answers just wait. 
I have something better. Think about that. God answers every prayer you pray. Is yes, is no, or wait. I got something better. Just hold on. Um, but have you ever been disappointed by prayer because you didn't get the answer you wanted? Will you trust that God is in control and he knows what's best even when it's hard? Will you trust God in that? A lot of us have been through hard stuff. You've seen, you know, people have died in our lives and there's a lot of unanswered questions that sometimes we have to, at the end of the day, we've had, we have to conclude that God knows best and that he's in control. And whatever he did, it was for his reasonings that we don't understand. Will you trust that about God? Will you trust that about your father? We have a good father. He's, he's not like, you know, whatever concept you have of an earthly father. So it's just like our kids, any, you know, our parents. Like our children, we have to learn how to take a no. I have to teach my kids that a lot. Learn how to take a no. Everybody's not going to say yes to you all the time. Everybody had to learn that the hard way? You got to learn how to take a no in life. Sometimes it's no. And you got to live with it. All right, it's no. I got to go sit down. <laughs> Same with God. Can you take a no from God? Sometimes it's no. And you have to look at it as though he's a good father. If I'm telling my kids no, it's for a reason. It's for their safety. It's for their protection. It's because they don't know things that I know and they don't, they don't understand the whole picture. So no, go sit down. And yet we get mad at God said no, so I ain't praying no more. That's how we treat God. Right? Take a note. It's for, for our development. So God wants us to pray for fellowship, for development, and then also for dependency. God never wants us to live a life independent from him. God, help us on, the, on today. John 15, uh, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he that bears fruit, or he that bears much fruit from apart from me. I'm sorry, I read that all wrong. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is, what did I write? He, it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The key part is, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Just... If God just did everything for us and we never had to pray, soon we would take things for granted. We would cease to depend on God. A lot of our lives are very independent from God. We do what we want. We go where we want. We say what we want. And it's, God has nothing to do with it. And God is wooing us back to this place where he wants us not to do anything apart from him. That's a part of prayer. God. Should we do this? Should I go there? We've made, sometimes some of us make major life decisions without even asking God's opinion. And then we get down the road and be like, what did I do? This was terrible. But we didn't even ask for guidance or direction. Um, David, in the uh, Old Testament, if you do a study on David, he always inquired of the Lord. God, should I go out to battle? Should we do this? Should we, should we go? Should we stay? That's kind of like our lives should be with prayer. We're dependent on God. We can't do anything without him. So get you, let's think about being more dependent on God. Also, if we're, why pray if God already knows everything? It's for discovery. We need to discover what the will of God is. 1 John 5 14 through 15 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he what? And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request we have asked of him. This verse is, you commit this to memory. This is a great memory verse because it's all about discovering the will. When we pray, we're aligning our will with God's will. We're aligning our, this is why prayer is so important. We have to align our will 
with God's will. Look at this verse. It says, this is the confidence we have in him. We ask anything according to his will. He hears us. We'll have an answer. Now, how do you know what God's will is unless you're asking him, unless you're talking with him, unless you're spending time with him? So the more time you spend with God, the more you see things his way. The more you want the things that he wants, the more you desire the things he desires. It all comes in prayer. It also, so just think about it. If you're spending time with God and you're getting alone with him and the more you're with God, the more what he wants becomes what you want. And so you're not asking for crazy things. He's already putting it in your heart, what you're supposed to, like, oh yeah, God, and then I want this. And because I feel like you want me to go this way. And I feel like, oh yeah, and I feel like I should stop doing that. And I should go this way. Right? The more we spend time with him, the more, it's like a, it's a merge. It's a Holy Ghost sink. It's, he's uploading and downloading. And, yeah. The more you spend time with him. It says, um, Psalms 37 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And a lot of times we're like, oh, I got to delight. Oh, I got to delight in the Lord. No, that's not what that means. I'm going to be, oh, I got to stay so I can get the desires of my heart. Delight yourselves in the more you want to spend time with him, the more you just take pleasure in having that time with God, the more his desires will become your desires. It's an amazing thing. But we miss it because we're so scared of prayer. We're so burdened down by it. And we think we have to go through all this stuff. Then we're like, oh, well, I'm not praying. But this is why you are here for this particular message because God is drawing you. He's wooing you. He's telling you, I want to spend time with you. And it's not that complicated. It's real simple. I'm going to take all the pressure off of it. Just come to daddy God. Just come to me like a child. Real childlike. You ever notice how, how kids are? They just hug you with no bad. You know, they just really want to come to you. They're really genuine. As we grow, we distance ourselves from that. But God wants you to come back to that. So after all this is said and done, you're like, well, how, how do I start? Like, this is all good. Thanks for the message. But how, I don't even know where to start. I still feel a little awkward when I'm praying. The best thing to do is simply just start praying the word of God. Find you a verse and just start praying it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thank you, Lord, that you're my shepherd. And I thank you that you're not going to let me want for anything. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. Thank you, Lord, for rest and for peace and for safety. Thank you, Lord. For God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son. Thank you, Lord, that you love me. You gave me, you gave, you love me enough to give me your son. That's awesome. It's real simple. Get you, get you a verse. Just read through it. That's just talking to God. It's real simple. And remember, what you put into your prayer life is what you're going to get out. Like any good relationship. Like any good relationship. You could talk on the fly, you know, with your friends or with your significant one. You could like, okay, all right, talk to you later. Okay, call you, text each other. You're just going, oh, wait, I got a meeting. I got, you, you know, you t touch base throughout the day like that. That's cool. But then every now and then, with your friends or with your significant person, like, we need to sit down and have dinner. We need just to sit down and just talk. Let's just spend some time. Let's go walk the lake. Let's just spend some quality time together, right? Same thing with God. Yes, you could pray to him on the fly while you're driving, you're commuting back to work. Oh, I got to meet him. Lord, just bless this, bless it. But every t now and then, you got to sit down and spend some good quality time with God. And it doesn't have to be awkward. You know, a lot of times, you know, we're like, okay, God's going to talk to me, so, you know, back and forth. And then we're like, wait for 30 seconds, like, I didn't hear nothing. Okay, never mind. No, he doesn't want to talk to me. That's not true. He talks to you through the word of God. So the more you read your word, that's how he talks to you. Now, raise your hand if you've been in here and you felt the Lord talk to you. You felt him you felt him talk to you. So uh, that's great. So the, for everyone who's in here that doesn't think that God talks to you, we're all not crazy. God talks. 
He doesn't talk in a loud like, this is what I want you to. It's not always, no, it's not all like that. It's like a knowing. It's a knowing. You got an inner knowing. And that this is, I know what God wants me. I know the direction I'm supposed to go. But how do you know someone's voice unless you spend a lot of time with them? Right? A lot of you, if, if your mom calls you, you already, oh, that's my mom. Or one of your kids, oh, Lord, that's my kid yelling. Like, you know, you know, you know voices by spending time. So that's how you get to know God's voice. You got to spend time with them. And then you know, then you won't be all confused. Was that God? Was that the enemy? Was that me? I don't know. That's a sign that you're not, we're not spending enough time with God. You don't know, God says, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. So let's just commit this time to God. Um, let's commit to really loving him and having a really simple, I don't even, if you're even a, a seasoned saint, just a real simple prayer life. Let's start that this week. Real simple, really embracing God as Abba Father, as Daddy God, that he really loves you and he really cares about you that much, that he cares about every intricate detail of your life. But will you have enough faith to believe that he loves you, that you're adopted, that you're his child, and that he wants to spend time with you? A lot of times you gotta, we have to lose the slave mentality that, you know, God doesn't want me. That's a lie. He died for you. So he does want you. And he wants you to, you're here today because he wants to spend some more time with you. So let's stand at this time. We're going to commit ourselves to prayer this week. We're going to commit ourselves to lighting, lightening our load.